Well, to start this video, it would be important to identify first, actually, who is not either a member of the resistance or part of it. So in order to define what the resistance is, we of course have to determine who isn't part of the resistance, which may not be so straightforward as one might think. There are, of course, enemy agents that might be embedded in any group, organization, or place. Those naturally would not be part of the resistance. In fact, they are enemies of it. <clears throat> and this comes down, of course, to any concept, any resistance-based concept, any group or individual who is involved or engaged in some sort of resistance movement naturally is going to be looking out for the frauds, which are, in fact, enemy operatives. Now, the other one are those who are not, in fact, actively engaged in any sense of the word. And that's obviously a lot easier to identify. Well, it can be. So, to identify these two types, we'll go ahead and look at things that would be signs of essentially non-association uh, with some sort of resistance activities. The first element that you often find when it comes to those that are not actually engaged in the resistance movement is the use of meaningless words and slogans. When spoken, the words usually carry no meaning. And often when there are enemy agents, they may use things incorrectly, and somebody who is part of a resistance would naturally lay probes out to determine whether or not that individual has some kind of ulterior motive underneath their actions, or if they're simply just going along with things and regurgitating. Either way, neither of those two options uh, form a necessarily uh, immediate ally, as it were. Now, there's always points for opportunity, and some individuals who may or may not be aware that they're just, their words are meaningless, essentially. Well, some of those people might be uh, still useful in some manner. Whereas when you're dealing with an enemy agent, you have to tread more carefully, as it were. A resistance member, on the other hand, might use slogans and other sort of public messages, but in a very targeted and specific manner. And there also might be a level of uh, secrecy behind the use. And in some cases, you might find operatives who are posing as somebody who is simply regurgitating slogans, essentially trying to fly under the radar. It is, however, unlikely that you'll find uh, resistance agents actually posing as enemy agents under undercover, right, under guise. Now, the main thing to notice, the main distinction here is that people who are part of a resistance movement in the concept of that thing do not complain. When you get attacked by an enemy, complaining is a waste of time. If you're going to essentially uh, vent your frustrations with an attack that you've been has been made against you, then it should be designed in such a way that you gain a tactical advantage. Essentially, uh, it, it makes the other person look um, uh, bad, right? However, the acts of complaining, of public complaining, they are not the uh, measures of somebody part of resistance that is part of somebody like a child complaining to a parent. The expectation there is that eventually their complaining will succeed and the other person will give in. That only happens when you're talking about allies or friends. When you're talking about enemy, your complaining only emboldens them. And thus members of resistance movements do not complain. Now these complaints can and usually do involve paperwork, making files, and issuing quote-unquote formal complaints. While the person doing this might feel like they're doing something, right, there is the inherent um, belief behind the action that it will obtain something. Obviously, anybody who's a member of an actual resistance knows that it won't. The only things that you can send as part of a member of a resistance are essentially speaking threats and demands, right? Just like when you're in any war, the enemy will not give in to complaints. They'll just laugh and throw it in the trash. And that is exactly what our current enemy does. 
they laugh and throw them in the trash every time somebody submits a complaint. And so anybody who submits a complaint either is a liar and they're an enemy agent acting under guise, or more than likely they're ignorant. But both, actually both options nowadays are fairly likely. Also, the idea of protesting, as far as most of us are aware anyway, or at least what we're taught, is not an effective measure used by protesters or by um, <laughs> members of resistance. It's not effective use by protesters either, of course. But usually it's a design by the opposition to create a mechanism so that they can embed their undercover agents and uh, essentially uh, affect their operations under the cover of a quote-unquote peaceful protest. Peaceful protests have never been effective, and they are tantamount to complaining. They're basically the same thing. In some cases, the uh, gathering of people can prove to be a beneficial mechanism for the resistance, but usually not. So most people who are members of actual resistance groups, they don't waste their time marching around and waving signs. That is, uh, is of course, a thing with at which the occupational forces, the enemy, uh, would, of course, snigger. Now, on the other hand, you might find in some cases of uh, impromptu uh, unions, I suppose, or rallies, where groups of people get together and they're not exactly protesting, they're simply gathering around and sharing information and organizing. Those are possibly the events that the enemy is most afraid of. Because in that context, the individuals, they're not complaining, they're not whining, and they're not shouting, they're simply getting together and talking which usually after that stage, which essentially is a component of planning, you have determination. And that is a much bigger problem for them. And so they, of course, rule out all efforts to disband such assemblies. So the next element to notice before we get into who exactly is part of the resistance is to identify exactly who our enemy is. And this is, of course, the enemy in every sense of the word of any resistance movement. A resistance movement generally is understood to be somebody who is operating against an entrenched opponent, possibly even uh, guerrilla tactics, right? Having to hide from abuse or some sort of overt attack by an individual that controls the area that you're in. So if you're trying to understand who the enemy are, there's a few questions you'll have to ask. However, to get a good understanding of, uh, first, what the foundation for the enemy operations is, we can go to a book called A Law Dictionary Adopted to the Constitution and Laws of the United States of America and the several states of the American Union. References to the civil and other systems of foreign law by John Bouvier, Volume 2, 1883, Philadelphia. And this is the 15th edition, thoroughly revised and greatly enlarged. No claim of a Sestu Q or Sestu K trust against his trustee for property held on an express trust shall be barred by any statute of limitations. A tenant of for life shall have no right to commit equitable waste unless such right is expressly conferred by the instrument creating the estate. There shall be no merger by operation of law only of any estate the beneficial interest in which would not be deemed merged in equity. A mortgager entitled for the time being to possession of the profits of land as to which the mortgage G shall have given no notice for his intention to take possession may sue for such possession or for the recovery of such profits or to pre previate or recover damages in respect of any trespass. So here's defined, defining who in fact can actually recover damages for the so-called charge of trespass or other wrong relative thereto. 
in his own name only, unless the cause of action arises upon a lease or other contract made jointly with any other person. Any absolute assignment a chose in action, of which express notice in writing shall have been given to the debtor, shall pass the legal right thereto from the date of notice, and all remedies for the same and the power to give a good discharge, provided that if the debtor, etc., shall have had notice of any conflicting claims to such debt, he shall be entitled to call upon such claimants to interplead. Stipulations as to time or otherwise which would not have been deemed of the essence of the contract in equity shall receive the same construction as formerly in equity. A mandamus or an injunction may be granted or a receiver appointed by an interlocutory order which may be made either unconditionally or on terms and an injunction may be granted to prevent or prevent <laughs> threatened waste or trespass. There you get that word in. Whether the estates be legal or equitable, or whether the person against whom the injunction is sought or is not in possession under any claim of title, or does or does not claim a right to the act sought to be restrained under the color of title in proceedings arising from collision or collisions at sea, where both ships are at fault and rules hereto enforced to the court of admiralty shall prevail. So there's a few things to note here. First of all, the Court of Admiralty is a specific mechanism that was incredibly hated by the colonists of the um, colonial period in the United States, anyway. And so here, this law of 1883 in the United States is specifically stipulating the Admiralty Court. That tells you this is foreign for one. And it was kicked out before under arms, reemplaced through fraud, and of course under arms as well. Now the other thing to notice here is that everything that it's talking about, even though it's really wordy and lengthy, there's another distinction they make. One is legal or equitable. The idea behind that of, of we've been incorrectly taught is that legal means lawful it doesn't it means on paper legal means paperwork a legal instrument is a drawn-up document to present a sort of legal um, thing action whatever equity refers to tangible physical value Right, something that you actually hold, whether it be, say, gold or something of inherent value in use, food, and of course, a house, the actual structure itself and the land that it's on. In some cases, you can own the structure but not the land, and the land but not the structure. And those things get a little bit hazy. In addition, we have the formulation of an estate. And essentially what it's saying here is that those under this law, mind you, under this law, those individuals who are residing on property and paying property tax are paying property tax to an estate, which they don't control, thus making them, essentially speaking, under lease. Now, when, this is the big one, when they are, it was decided that they are to leave that space, they become trespassers. So, trespass is a word that specifically only relates to this type of function, and it's foreign. In questions relating to the custody of infants, the rules of equity shall prevail. So, like I said, an infant being a child is it's deemed, essentially speaking, equitable property. Generally, in all matters in which there is any conflict between the rules of common law and the rules of equity, the latter shall prevail. So that's a, apart from all of the other things that are contained in these types of documents. That's a really important one to understand when we're attempting to identify who our enemy actually is. 
So now you can get a good understanding of just how ridiculous it is that people put no trespassing signs up believing that it's going to protect their private individual property rights. It will not. They are, in fact, if deemed uh, unfit or for any other reason to no longer have lawful possession of the property, they are deemed trespassers. And that's the only way it goes. If somebody breaks into your house or walks onto your property, they are not trespassing against you. They are trespassing against the estate which you do not control. That is the municipal corporation that we call a city or the county or the quote unquote state. They are the ones in that mechanism that control the property and anybody who violates their property is trespassing against them and therefore you can never take a claim of trespass. That is only a charge that can be leveraged by policy enforcement, the police, the various mechanisms, prosecutors or whatnot those who have the ability to enforce such a thing as trespass on behalf of the estate. So if somebody wants to protect their private property, they cannot do it under this trespass, this phony trespass law of foreign occupation from the Admiralty Court. Now, the other important question to ask, or I guess the main important question to ask when you're attempting to identify the enemy is who is going to be using force, right? Who needs to come and force you, in most cases physically, to do what they say or else? If somebody has to do that or resort to that, they are an enemy. Does not matter what they say, what argument they make. You're never going to say that somebody who holds you up in the street is and and demands all your money for for food. Well, I suppose people do actually say that. Somebody gets mugged, right? Somebody holds them up with a gun and says, "Give all, over all your money," and then that person might go along and say, "Oh, well, he's poor. He needs to do it." Not an enemy, right? Just misunderstood. No, when somebody physically uses force against you, they have the fortitude and they have made up their minds that you, if you don't if you don't do what they say, are going to die. That is an enemy, period. There's no way around it. Once somebody escalates the use of physical force, they become an enemy. It doesn't matter if they're drunk, angry, uh, depressed, poor, or wearing any uniform whatsoever. Anyone that does that instantly becomes a practical enemy of the person that they are accosting or assaulting, whatever you want to call it. So today I think we know who, by and large, mostly those who will be wielding such uh, efforts, such force, as it were, against us in order to enforce the trespass against their estate, not ours. And who, in fact, is going to be leveraging force, you know, f forcing somebody clearly who doesn't want to do what they're forcing them to do as these words work? Um, you know, who is going to be doing that? Who is going to be enforcing this stuff about the estate, the legal and equitable ability to claim it against a leasee? And, of course, the rules of the Admiralty Court. Who is going to be doing that? In that context, you can only ever look at these individuals as overt enemies and nothing else. They are nothing else. They are enemies and they are the occupation. Any resistance movement is naturally going to gravitate against them first because they're the ones that are going to actually be wielding the life and death decision of do what I say or I'm going to kill you, right? That is their ultimate goal. There is no uniformed officer throughout the United States of so-called law enforcement that does not constantly think about using force to kill individuals in their community in order to take their stuff. None. There are none that don't think about that. Some might be uh, fearful of those individuals that can protect themselves, but make no mistake, these individuals are frontline enemies. And then there's the ones that are behind them. 
And that is what they are. Enemy combatants. They are not your friends. They are not doing things just because that you grew up with them that benefit you and no one else. No, ultimately, they are occupational forces, ignorant or otherwise. And they are saving no one except the estate for foreign interests. And that is it. There's no way around it. And any arguments that they ever say is to convince you that they're on your side, regardless of the evidence or facts to the contrary. Now, in the United States Constitution, it essentially speaking defines exactly what I said. It tells you how to identify an enemy combatant, an occupational force. In the Fourth Amendment, it states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So let's go ahead and look at that one first. What they are doing is forcible seizure under the Constitution. That's because they're not constitutional law enforcement, which therefore makes them unreasonable searches and seizures under the Constitution. Because in order for it to be a reasonable search or seizure, it has to be done under the Constitution. And if that is being violated, because it says shall not be violated, it is being violated by enemy occupation forces, enemies of the U.S. Constitution. Now, anybody at all who actually served in the U.S. Armed Forces has a duty to uphold and defend the Constitution as they swore allegiance to it. And that includes intervention against any uniformed force, sheriffs, police officers, Department of Corrections, uh, any of your little Gestapo thugs that are enemy occupations, they have a duty to intervene against those individuals when they implement a force of seizure or enforce seizure. Now, there's not much that you can do when you're talking about facing superior force, and a lot of this stuff might, in some cases, be a suicide mission when it comes to directly and physically intervening. So there's different forms of intervention and different ways that you can go about it that might be safer, especially knowing and considering that you are, in fact, facing individuals who, without a second thought, will kill you. Right? I don't know why people might go around and thank sheriffs and police and whatnot when the next day, if that person gets the order, they're coming through your front door and they're going to shoot you just to take your house and just to steal your stuff so that they can then sell it at auction. It's, it is mind-blowing that these people are seen by anyone at all as nothing but enemy occupiers and foreign adversaries. That is what they are. And, of course, that shall not be violated, which is which makes it an unreasonable search or seizure. And the warrants that are issued are not constitutional warrants, but they're actually letters of mark. Because here, it talks about a warrant that is supported by oath or affirmation, of which these aren't, by the way. Even though they're signed by judges, it does not count. And they have to particularly describe the place to be searched and persons or things to be seized. Now, nowhere in there does it say that that seizure can benefit for a profit. That is a letter of mark. When somebody, and that's what's known, of course, as privateering. When some group, organization, government, whatever you, whatever you will, community, publish a letter of mark, they go to somebody who is a professional. And they say to that person, you get to keep a percentage of the spoils for whatever you take from the enemy. That is what sheriffs do in the United States and all the other phony law enforcement. Every single one of them, they turn profits from the things that they steal from the people in the community. They are nothing more than serving letters of mark. They are not warrants. So if somebody comes up to you and say, I have a signed warrant, you tear it up and say, that is not a constitutional warrant. You cannot serve a letter of mark on me as private privacy. Now, of course, you have to be ready to fight them. Because like I said, these people, they have no fear of the people unless that person is ready to kill them as well. That's because, like I said a million times, I think, <laughs> they're enemy occupation forces. 
Now, under the Fifth Amendment, it states, No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime, unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces, or in the militia, when in actual service, in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be consult that. Be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Now, this is the one that they constantly use to say trespassing is constitutional, or at least protect laws against trespassing are constitutional. Now, naturally, they're not. They're simply just paying lip service to it because they are, in fact, enemies, and they have revised and completely used the Constitution like toilet paper. But either way, in the militia, land, or naval forces, you do not need an indictment or presentment from a grand jury during a time of war or public danger. What that means is that when you're going to hold somebody to the capital crime of treason, occupying our country unlawfully under the color of law, and engaging in, essentially speaking, what the definition of treason is in the Constitution that includes every single person wearing a so-called law enforcement uniform, every single one, is engaging in treason. And if you want to hold them for the infamous crime of that, or a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, you do not need the grand jury's presentment or indictment, because it's a time of war and public danger. Now, the deprivation of life, liberty, or property, that one is perhaps beaten to death. But either way, these two amendments are used continuously by individuals, possibly as part of the resistance movement, to say, look, they keep violating these things. And then along come the occupation forces, and what do they say? This is not a violation of blah, 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 because... Right? So it's just the word game going on there. But in order to recognize exactly who is part of the resistance, you have to recognize who the true enemy is. And anybody who is part of a resistance will treat them like an actual enemy. They will not essentially capitulate or play these little uh, nitty uh, childish games, right? Like Antifa and BLM and uh, Anonymous and some of these other groups out there, a lot of them play childish games, apparently anyway, because in some cases it's hard to tell. But either way, somebody who's actually a member of a resistance to these people and recognizes them for who they truly are have already committed to the cause, as it were, the same cause that the individuals around the world instigated so many centuries ago for independence. It's still the same cause today. Anybody who's involved in that cause already understands the consequences and already understands who they're facing. They're not going to go around playing the games or antagonizing them. When it comes to doing the deed, getting the job done, there will be no warning. Members in the resistance will go and take the fight to the enemy. They will not play games. And that's one of the big things. If you recognize that you're facing legitimate enemy occupation, you don't mess around, right? And obviously some people would say that this video is an example of messing around. <laughs> but I see it as a duty, a duty against the occupiers to not only recognize that's what they are, but also to hopefully inspire more members to join the resistance. So, in the context of what we just read, towing people's vehicles away is unreasonable seizure. Nobody gave them authority. There is no constitutional authority to go ahead and seize somebody's vehicle on any pretense. And it's not connected to the warrant. It states no unreasonable searches or seizures shall happen. Right? and no warrants. The warrant is a separate component. What is happening when people get their vehicle towed away at the owner's expense is how they say it. That individual towing company and that towing truck driver are engaging in treason. They are essentially speaking committing a crime 
the crime of an unreasonable seizure. And that's, well, it's hard to say considering the messing with our history, but people in the past allegedly who stole horses were put to death. And I know it sounds kind of extreme to most people, but the fact of the matter is, if you understand who you're dealing with, then there's no other option. Now, an ignorant tow truck driver who was just doing their job, quote unquote, might not be the actual target, the willful, knowledgeable act actor. However, I guarantee that if somebody resisted the towing away of their vehicle, that person would call the occupation forces and the occupation forces force under threat of death the forcible removal of that vehicle. So whenever you think about it like that, about the ultimate escalation, you recognize who your enemies actually are. Thus in the Constitution, it states that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless and when cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. So a writ of habeas corpus means a uh, instrument, a legal instrument, a document, Stipulating that a body is had. That is what you submit essentially to the militia, the law enforcement, true law enforcement, under the Constitution anyway, uh, that somebody has been unreasonably searched or seized. Well, actually, in this case, it would be seized because it's having the body. They're, they're holding something. Either it's a person or some object, something, right? So if somebody comes and tows away your car, under the Constitution, you would write to the militia to go get it back. However, in case of rebellion or invasion, either the militia is active or the militia is gone. And in that case, there's really no point in writing a, a legal document stating somebody's stolen your stuff because who's going to listen, right? <laughs> Either they're already active and you can just go talk to them, get them to get your stuff back. And of course, the militia is everybody who can keep and bear arms in the community, all the people. Uh, or you just have to go get it yourself, pretty much. And that usually involves paying the tow truck companies, of course, which uh, then inspires more of this... Um, unreasonable search and seizure that we get everywhere. Now, in the Third Amendment, no soldier in time of peace be quartered, no, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Now, most of this is usually framed in the context of British soldiers that would then go kicking down the doors of houses and they go in and stay. They weren't quote-unquote British soldiers, they were actually Marines. Or in the red coat. I did a video on that before. Now, the reason why this would go the other way, too, is that the idea of giving someone no quarter in a fight means you're going to kill them. You're not going to arrest them. You're not going to keep them prisoner. You are going to give them no quarter, and you're going to allow them no quarter as well. You will not allow them to stay anywhere. You will harass them all the way until they're dead, basically. That's what a no quarters war is. It's all or nothing. So this idea of taking somebody, forcible seizure, as it will, under the Constitution, which is not the same as the forcible seizure under the code or the legal definitions that we read before, or the forcible seizure that is practiced by our occupational forces that we currently call law enforcement. Well, the taking of somebody in the Constitution means that this is specifically addressing how you go about storing your prisoner, your captive. And they will probably be an enemy soldier, right? A prisoner of war. So let's say you go and capture the sheriff. That is a prisoner of war. They are enemy occupying forces wearing that uniform. When you go and capture them, you have to do it with the consent of the owner. That should be a no-brainer, but I have to imagine a lot of people probably broke into houses maybe during the colonial period with their captives, and then the owner got irritated for that and, essentially speaking, helped the captive escape. Things like that. You, you can have all kinds of consequences if you don't get consent of the owner. Also, it would be the you know owner might go to the enemy occupiers and let them know that somebody's being kept in their house. So if you think about that today, if you're going to go and capture the sheriff, 
then you should probably storm in the house of somebody who is, quote unquote, a member of your group, right? You wouldn't want to just go storm in some random person's house because that's going to create all sorts of problems. But I have to imagine stuff like that happens. Now, under the Ninth Amendment, it states the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. This particular section, this one has to do with the fact that they use all sorts of components in the Constitution to counteract others, and when they do that, you understand they are enemies. If you're in the Uniformed Armed Forces, you have taken an oath of allegiance to the Constitution. Whether or not you uphold that oath uh, refers to dereliction of duty, of course. But for those who take the oath seriously and uphold it, they have to identify that those who try and use certain sections of the Constitution to deny other sections are simply paying lip service to the Constitution and therefore are enemy combatants. Now it also states, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. So unlike what Google says, it does not say the supreme law of the territory of the United States. It is the supreme law of the land. And that's period. There's no argument around that. If you swear allegiance to the Constitution, you recognize it as the supreme law of the land, otherwise you're a dereliction of duty. So that inherently sets the U.S. armed forces up against the phony law enforcement, the occupation forces that we have here. Anybody wearing uniforms enforcing this anti-constitutional crap. It also means that if you perhaps don't owe allegiance to the Constitution, but you become a member of the resistance, then you recognize that this is the one that they're in opposition of. If they do not recognize the Constitution of the Supreme, as the supreme law of the land, as it says, then they're inherently enemies, one way or the other. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Nearly everything they do is contrary to the Constitution, and if you recognize the Constitution, absolutely nothing that they do has any standing. That's what notwithstanding means. It means it has no standing. It holds no water, carries no weight, means nothing. Their threats are only accomplished through lies and force, the threat of death, and nothing else, because they are enemy combatants. One way or the other, the only way to reestablish the true law and order, the Constitution, is to defeat the enemy occupiers. And there's no other way around it. You cannot work with them. As the saying goes, you cannot comply your way out of tyranny. Now, the true law enforcement under the Constitution, of which sheriffs are not, and therefore there's no such thing as a constitutional sheriff, despite all this stupid nonsense going around right now, is to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. If the militia is to execute the laws of the Union, it is not the sheriff, not the police, and it is not the ATF, DEA, FBI, FDA, whatever all the other nonsense is. None of them, and attorneys, judges, it doesn't matter, none of them are constitutional. None of them are allowed to enforce the laws of the Constitution. So whose laws are they actually enforcing? Now, under the Second Amendment, it states a well-regulated well -regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And there you get your definition of the militia. Now, what, now that we've identified who is not a member of the resistance, like we said, there's two ideas. There's the embedded enemy agent who's attempting to do all kinds of nasty things to you. And then there, of course, are the people who are ignorant and simply just going along with whatever they think is the mainstream choice. <clears throat> we also, of course, looked at who the enemy actually is to identify them. So now we have to understand what the role of the resistance is, what the resistance does. First of all, the main objective of the resistance will be rescue. And that's the word for it. When you're operating under the legitimate law of the Constitution, what you're actually doing is you're rescuing, regardless of what they say about you or anyone else who's doing it. If you're a member of the resistance, then you recognize the rescuing of unreasonably seized goods or people. 
when any of these occupational force, forces take the person of any single individual, does not matter the pretext. It is the duty of the resistance to then go and rescue that individual from the clutches of the enemy occupiers. This idea of rescuing is very important because it makes all the difference how you frame things. They know this. That is the reason why they continuously try and label everyone as criminals who do not go along with what they say, committing crimes, right? And then they try to make you look the part and they try to make you sound the part by making up all kinds of stupid rumors and bogus stories about you. There's no actual trial. There's no actual presumption of innocence. You are simply guilty out of the fact that you're not one of them. We all know this. However, when we look at the brainwashing mechanism, people get afraid and they don't want to be labeled certain things and so they comply and go along with tyranny. However, when you're a member of the resistance, you recognize the important use of words and thus when you speak, you should use the terms forcible, unreasonable seizure, threat by occupational enemy forces, and rescue of unlawfully seized goods or people. Now, the rescue of people is going to become a major component in the future because as these people ramp up their activities, they're going to be far more aggressive. They're going to show, show who they really are. That's a really dangerous world for many reasons. For one, they want to take the property of people, and those that resist will be considered detractors and then ultimately killed. Right? They'll be moved to certain locations and disappeared. That is how these enemy occupiers operate. They are enemies, but they always want to convince you they're not, because they recognize that once it is realized who they are, there is not enough force that they can marshal to deal with the raising of the true militia. They don't have the mechanism. Most cities have, say, roughly nine, eight or nine, what, well, small cities anyway, have roughly eight or nine police. Now, they'll be backed up by state highway patrol in most of the places in the United States and across the globe it's different, such as I know in Ecuador they have a huge number of national police and traffic police and city police and security guards and all these other different forces and virtually nobody in that country has any arms. So it's very un unlikely that they'll be even uh, uh, across the board that all the individuals would be able to resist. However, in the United States, there's far less phony law enforcement than there are members of the militia, those who can keep and bear arms. So, their primary tactic, of course, is fear and fraud. Make you afraid of them and try to expand their reach to more than it is. And fraud, pretending, of course, to be legitimate. And naturally, if you stand against them, then you're not. Now, the other component, which has probably been more likely as a, a mechanism in the past, was the rescuing of property. It's rare that I've ever heard of anybody actually rescuing somebody's towed vehicle. Mostly that person has to go and just pay some fine to the tow truck drivers because of uh, violating the uh, phony laws of the occupation forces. Um, but other objects might be a little bit more important. Nowadays, the rescue of people's houses is going to become a very big factor, especially considering things that happen at Lahaina. Things that I personally know to be going on in the Hawking Hills of Ohio, as well as other sections of the state, and actually pretty much everywhere around the globe. These uh, individuals, these occupational forces, part of the universal component, they are getting more aggressive and they really, really desire things of value. And they consider human beings, as it said before, infants, to be equitable things of value, property. So, in some cases, as they would see it, the rescue of property would actually relate to human beings as well. But then when you think about it in the context of rescuing trafficked children, you have a better understanding of what it means to rescue uh, unlawfully seized persons from these individuals. The phony state and occupational forces for sure traffic the largest number of children. 
Now, under their definitions, they would say it's not human trafficking because they're simply administering their property, property of the estate, of which we all are. So the real question, of course, is which side are you on? Right. And if you're obviously if you're on the side of resistance, then you've got you've got a, a impressive level of brainwashing to deal with when it comes to the ignorant people out there who are essentially complying to the, into their own destruction. And on the other hand, you have a very entrenched and aggressive enemy to deal with. Now, the next step to once you define exactly what you're doing as part of the resistance, what your mission is, as it were, is to understand consequences. It's to ask the questions of what happens then? And a lot of people actually get to this stage once they, through uh, life experience, are forced to recognize that they're dealing with an enemy and they're mostly dealing with it alone. Anybody who has been railroaded with a tax lien, eviction, or foreclosure notice suddenly feels like the walls and life is closing in around them and they flee somewhere for safety, usually to the very people that are causing the issue. Some, however, will decide to stand their ground and say, I am not going to let them do this. And at that moment, they recognize one way or the other that they're dealing with an enemy. And of course, when you do that, the consequences start filtering around in your mind. It is a very good idea to do this before you encounter a active situation, a dangerous situation, as it were, so that you can plan ahead of time and that you can't say or rather, that you saw it coming. If you see it coming, you can deal with it a lot more level-headed than when it's simply sprung upon you and you were never expecting it. So that's really unfortunate for the people who've constantly been living in this delusion that the so-called law enforcement is there to protect them. They're not. They're there to protect the quote-unquote estate for the holders of that estate, of which none of us are. So when you're thinking about consequences, it's important to do this in a practical manner and not, you know, hysterically or panic, right? So the first thing to do is you don't panic. You recognize consequence of actions, but that doesn't mean that the action shouldn't be taken. It just simply means that you have to plan for the consequence after the action be taken. Another word for this is risk mitigation. And this is something that, of course, people will talk about in the military. If you have a botched operation, how big of an impact is that going to look? There's pretty much no way that you can execute an operation and it be botched with no consequences to the image, the presentability, or the apparent force that can be brought by an entity. And thus, every consecutive military failure that we've had has emboldened enemies of the military in the United States. But the same goes with any group or organization. If you do something and fail at it, then that's ultimately going to reflect badly on you. And that's just something that has to be planned for, which is failure. You do have to plan for failure, at least as a consequence, right? The consequences of failure. You don't plan to fail. You know, nobody would say that. But failure is a aspect that is probable, especially when you're talking about going up against an active and willful intelligent enemy. So you are possibly going to fail. But you have to mitigate that risk. Perhaps ways to make the failure not seem so bad. In the rather dramatic idea of somebody standing their ground against a home siege, of which they alone have to face down possibly 1530 uh, uniformed thugs from law enforcement, state troopers, and police, that person can inflict such bad casualties on those individuals that even though they fail and ultimately die in the suicide attempt, they render the they render the element of fear to as hopefully spread anyway among all the other occupation forces so that they never again attempt a home siege. That is the future that we want to live in. Well, actually it would be nice to live in a future where these people don't exist anymore and there aren't uniform thugs patrolling everywhere. Now, the next question that you have to ask are possible uh, uh, efforts of reprisal, right? Reprisal is a response that's really well known when you're talking about the context of fictionalized gangs, 
in which one gang makes a hit and then that gang retaliates in kind. That's an idea of reprisal. However, when you're dealing with a, a actual a, an enemy, a real enemy, reprisal will, might not be in kind. Reprisal might come in a much bigger manner. Let's say you steal a shipment of guns from the ATF. Well, their reprisal will be to burn down a city. That's what I mean by reprisal. Their level of reprisal often is so far above and beyond what the action of one individual does, and so you have to weigh those consequences before you make an action. Will th Could their reprisal be something so dramatic as to slaughter an entire school of children? The answer might be yes. However, it's unlikely that if you stand your ground against the forcible seizure of your house, that reprisal will be that far out. However, if a whole community rises up and says, we're going to stop paying our taxes, then absolutely they would reprise by slaughtering all the children of that community. With, without a doubt, they would do those things. And just like I said, you have to put yourself into that mental position of, okay, I'm now the criminal and they are pointing guns at me. Will they kill me? If the answer is yes, then you comprehend exactly what we're facing today. Now, the next question is in relation to insulation. How many layers of insulation do you need in order to, essentially speaking, get away with whatever activity you're doing? If you're going to deny something to the enemy, if you're going to rescue something from the enemy, how many layers of insulation do you need to make sure that they don't know it was you or that even though they know it was you, they have no actual way of finding the individuals who made the affected the operation and that also plays into reprisal if you have sufficient number of layers then they don't know who to take reprisal out against but often they always need an activity of reprisal and so even if they do do something in response that is so above and beyond any normal person's reaction such as if you got punched in, in the face and then you went and then or you punch someone in the face in a bar fight and then that person went and slaughtered your entire family, like most people would say, well, that's a huge overreaction. But that is how these people operate. They overreact constantly to even the smallest provocations. And so if that happens, you can't blame yourself. That's who the enemy actually is. Now, the next component that people need to understand when they're in the resistance movement dealing against these foreign occupiers is the small unit coordination that is taught in most conventional militaries. Of course, the first component to any small unit operation is to, in fact, gather the unit. This requires, of course, socializing and gathering of people. Otherwise, you're operating your, on your own and unit tactics don't really make a difference. If you're on your own, you're on your own. If, in fact, you have gathered a unit, then you're going to need to do th certain things to ensure that your unit is prepared to face future actions. Now, one of the things that's most prevalent among small units are hand and arm signals, the ability to communicate without talking or without any other distinguishing effect other than simply, hey, oh, look over here, right? Now, the fist has many different meanings. In the Marine Corps, the fist means halt. <coughs> now, it also means, quote, unquote, BLM Antifa social justice nonsense and all the other slogans and going and burning down local businesses and attacking neighborhoods. Reprisal by the uh, enemy occupiers, of course. So the fist could mean many different things. It is not a universal gesture. And the Marine Corps does not hold, essentially speaking, a hostile tone to it. But in most other cases, the fist is a hostile symbol. So it is important to notice when we're talking about hand and arm signals, they might not all be universal. Now, some symbols are sort of universal. In most contexts today, people understand what the symbol of the heart is, for instance. However, another means of communication that might not be universal, but at least is recognized by most people is that of the flag or semaphore. The ability to communicate things based off a flag is well ingrained into our global culture today, whereas in the past you might have had some individuals who had absolutely no concept of what a flag meant or was supposed to symbolize. Now, the pointing the finger is another example of something that has multiple meanings to it. It could be an indicator of a direction or an indicator of culpability.
So it really just depends on the context, but you wouldn't be able to identify this as a universal symbol. However, when you're talking about small unit tactics, it is not as important as what the universal signals for things are, but rather whether or not your message will be understood by your compatriots. Now, the thumbs up is an example of a mostly universal signal, and that's because of the global education that we have today, <clears throat> especially from videos, uh, movies, TV shows, and whatnot. So thumbs up can usually be understood as a gesture of uh, things being okay or some sort of positive gesture. It might not always be the case, but usually it is, especially when you're talking about the global understanding that is um, instituted through the uh, internet, basically. Now, the next thing that any small unit is going to need to focus on are the roles of each individual member. What is each person's job? And this is a very important one. Naturally, when it comes to any resistance movement and any sort of actual warfare, firearms and physical force is going to be a primary component. So yes, while you should have small units that are effective with firearms and all that stuff, if people don't know what their role is, then they're probably not going to be very effective. Doesn't matter what level of force they actually carry. And the same can go for, of course, resistance efforts involved in some sort of propaganda. Where you're going around and spreading messages, if people don't know what their jobs are, then you won't be able to function as a unit. And there's no way around that. This in the military is taught as knowing your sector of fire. You need to know which in which direction you are going to be shooting in a firefight. And then this, metaphorically, is applied to almost every other level of the military, including something simple as running the, um, a kitchen. When it comes to the sector of fire, this is usually determined as a scope of vision, a area in which you have to constantly be surveying. Depending on how many are in your unit, you might have a larger uh, area of fire or uh, sector of fire. And all of your other unit members should in fact have a coordinating amount or section of fire. Obviously, if you have a unit, you can determine how you want to set that up. You could have somebody who has a larger sector of fire. Somebody has a smaller one. And same thing as in any company. Some people have more responsibilities than others. And often, they're the people that shouldn't have those responsibilities that have them because promotion is used as a reward system. This is not a reward system. Anybody who is engaged in an actual physical altercation or some sort of dire situation, some sort of problem, it doesn't matter who gets, uh, who, who gets aggrandizement. It matters who's effective, who can actually deal with it. When you have a really bad accident, all the people who think that they're experts suddenly aren't. They might get afraid and run away. And then those individuals that are capable, they will intercede and fix the problem. Whereas when the accident isn't so bad, well, then you have all the people who are essentially uh, showboaters. So in this context, when you're talking about an actual firefight, which is what most people train for, they don't train for it well. Most people train on a lateral range, and they all shoot in the same direction. However, when you're training for <clears throat> your particular sector of fire, you don't want to be shooting in the same direction, because then not only are you open behind yourself, but you're also possibly wasting resources attacking the same target. So this comes to the idea that there are, in fact, no insignificant part of a team, of a unit. If somebody drops the ball on their job, it impacts every other member of that unit. Doesn't matter what your role is, everyone's responsibility is integral to the functioning of that unit and the safety of all the members involved. Now, naturally, most people operate on their phones today, but a lot of this resistance effort actually does require engagement, not just on a cyber where everybody wants to be hackers nowadays, or so it seems. But you actually have to physically scope out areas. You have to understand the, the area of operations, as it's called in the military. You have to know what your terrain is, where you're going to be executing your operations. If you don't know the terrain and you don't know the area, then you're more likely to succumb to it, to fail, as it were.
Also, when it comes to these physical operations, one of the primary components to focus on in any resistance movement is obstruction. You do not want to obstruct your own, you want to obstruct them. And this could come in many forms, but generally speaking, uh, physical obstruction, when you're talking about the movements of occupational forces, perhaps finding a way to hold up a, um, a, a, a occupational forces when they're responding to some sort of seizure event, well, that, of course, would benefit any other resistance efforts that are being done in the area. Now, mental games are also a primary component of any operation. And the same goes especially, or doubly actually, for resistance movements when you're talking about fighting a, a enemy force that may or may not be superior. In that context, fishing line proves a very effective tool for mental, uh, mental games. You can string up fishing line and make it look like a tripwire which then will make somebody more paranoid of running into tripwires. And of course, as anyone knows, there are fish hooks usually attached at the end of fishing lines. So if somebody's afraid of stepping on a fish hook or putting one in their thumb, which is fairly common for anyone who is a quote-unquote angler, well, then you know how effective it would be as a mental deterrent to the enemy. Now, the next part of our operations comes down to the tactics that mostly the enemy uses, but does go both ways. These are simply tactics or, or tools that can be used. And this comes down to the idea of compromise, frame, kill. To compromise somebody, that means to either get them to do something bad or discover what they're doing that's bad and then leverage it against them. It is often considered blackmail even though blackmail is sort of a misnomer. It's an incorrect way to say it. Compromising someone, on the other hand, that is the terminology mostly used by professionals. Somebody has been compromised. It either means they've been exposed or it means that they have been flipped. They are compromised. Hence, you get the, under, uh, uh, the uh, idea of compromising yourself or compromising or being involved in compromise. It's actually not a good thing. Now the next level is to frame. This usually happens when you can't compromise somebody because they're uncompromisable. Or simply, they do not respect your uh, attempt to leverage it. So maybe you have dirt on somebody, but they simply will not comply to what you're saying. They don't care what you know about them. Then it comes time to frame. Now, if they're uncompromisable, then framing might not work as well. Because if the person has no history of misconduct, <clears throat> it might be a little bit more difficult to frame them for something that they did. On the other hand, if they have a history of petty misconduct, it is a lot more easier to frame them for something that's much more drastic, much worse. Like framing somebody who's a petty thief for murder. However, somebody who has no history, you're probably not going to be able to frame, so... Yes, framing is uh, something that's specific to, or the next stage after compromise. Compromising doesn't work, then you frame them and get them to go down uh, through essentially fraud. Now, if compromising your target and framing your target, they, if they don't work, then the next step is to kill them, or at least attempt to. If you cannot compromise them, if you cannot frame them, and you cannot kill them, then you are dealing with a truly difficult enemy a hard target. Most of the times, once it gets to the kill portion, though, it is not done in the way that you might see in Hollywood or TV shows. It's more likely going to be poisoning, perhaps through a syringe. Either way, it's usually death by natural causes or perhaps dying in a car wreck. But this is the primary stage used by most singular operators of the enemy occupiers. This is how the police do it. And we've all seen this in TV shows and movies. They take you into the police station and question you, and they attempt to get you to comp compromise yourself by saying something stupid that they can then leverage against you while pretending to be your friend. If that doesn't work, then they frame you, they plant evidence, they make up charges, they do whatever they can to say that you are a nasty person. If that doesn't work, they kill you. Plain and simple.
Now the next component to any unit operation, individual either as well, individual operations and unit operations equally, need to develop things called target packages. This is when you identify your target and you've asked all the relevant questions and you know who you're going after. And you know for certain that this person is your actual target, right? If you're in a resistance movement, you do not want to get your target wrong. And this relates to having a target package. Now, a target package might be one page. However, more than likely, it will be multiple pages. Now, the many pages of a target package are going to include various different things. And in fact, it's all up to the unit and individual how much they actually want to include in a target package, how thorough they need to be. And it also depends on what task they're actually carrying out, what the mission for this particular target really is. The questions, of course, would be, is this the right target? Are they, are they a target? Are they legitimate? Do we have the right person? If the answer is yes, then the question becomes, do we attempt, do we leave them where they are? Or do we benefit most from leaving them where they are? And perhaps turning them into an asset, flipping them, or essentially just following them and gathering information. And if the answer is no, then you move on to the third question, which is, what's the most effective way to take them out? So the, all of that, all of those are questions that go into the development of a target package. Now, some or the first element, at least, of a target package is to get aliases, known names. You may not have the person's true name, but either way, to develop the target package, you will probably have some name that you can apply to them, even if that name is name unknown. Next, you're going to need addresses. These would be any addresses that are associated with the individual, specifically. Not addresses associated with others. Right, you don't need to, well, you might need that level of in-depthness, but usually for a target package, that's unnecessary. You only need the addresses specifically associated with your target. The next thing that you need are the associates. Anybody who is involved with this person, indirectly, family, friends, business associates, colleagues, and those who maintain a strong connection with the person, even if they might not fit into any of the other categories. Associates mainly would be relegated to those people who have activity. Sometimes past associates might be important to include, but usually not. Either way, when you're looking through the associates, it is up to the person, obviously, as in all cases, developing the target package, how in-depth they want to include the information that they uncover for targeting the, or for building the target package. Now, the biggest one of a target package are going to be points of exploitation. Now, there's many places that you can get points of exploitation, and probably the most common would be to look at somebody's search history on the internet or other such activities. Either way, points of exploitation might not always be so straightforward, and they would probably lead to things like the three that we looked at before, compromise, frame, or kill. And that will require research into where exactly the person is exploitable. Do they have a drug habit? Do they go out to bars a lot? Do you see them uh, frequenting disreputable areas? Or do they leave themselves open by taking the same route every day? All of those things could be points of exploitation. 